Hello YouTubers, this is Cessna Ace back again with another video. Over this past weekend, the wife and kids and I all drove to Orlando, Florida to go to Disney World. Oh really? Yes, uh, we did drive. We live in Jacksonville, Florida, which is only about a two and a half hour drive from Orlando, Florida, which, as I believe I mentioned, is where Walt Disney World is located, along with Universal and uh, SeaWorld and a few other places. We went because we recently celebrated our 19th wedding anniversary. Yes, I married a woman who could put up with me for 19 years. And uh, our youngest, well not our youngest, our eldest daughter recently celebrated her 17th birthday. Just a scary age for teenage girls. For the fathers. Of course, next stop, 18. Now, we drove there in our new car. Well, it's new to us. We traded in our 2000 Saturn for a 2009 Honda Accord. Now, I see a lot of Honda Accords on the road, and they vary in sizes from tiny two-door sedans or coupes to humongous four-door SUVs. Ours is closer to being a humongous four-door SUV. Even though it's big and I would presume heavy, it's fast. This has nothing to do with the title of this video, by the way. I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. It's fast, and it's quiet, and it gets good gas mileage. Better gas mileage than the Saturn. The Saturn was tiny, and it only had a 9-gallon tank. The Accord, well, I originally thought it had a 16-gallon tank, but that's wrong. It's either an 18-gallon tank or a 20-gallon tank. So on the first half of the tank, we can go farther in this Accord than we could go in the Saturn, if that makes any sense, considering the Saturn is half, was half the size of this Accord. But technology marches on. A lot of neat features in this Accord. Uh, I, of course, love the M-Dash CD player, and it's got a port where you could plug in your iPod or MP3 player to play through the sound system, and it sounds great. And the CD player, it'll play something that a lot of CD players won't, which is uh, CDs, uh, CDRs that have WMA files on them. The w WMA files were created for use by computers. A lot of CD players, portables especially, won't play WMA. You have to really look for WMA. And if you get a lot of these uh, downloadable CDs at places like Dave and Buster's, a lot of the uh, albums are available only as WMAs, although some are available as MP3s, but many are available only on WMAs. And uh, at the time, I only had one CD player that would play WMAs and, well, the DVD-ROM drive in the computer. But I have since bought a portable that will. I had to look for it, and I have the car now. Anyway, I digress. Here in Jacksonville, we're a connecting point for I-95, I-10 and I-295. So we're constantly getting on and off interstates. Now, as is normally the case when you go onto an on-ramp to get onto an interstate, you're going to accelerate because by the time you get to the end of the on-ramp, you're going to be wanting to 
be traveling at the same speed as the traffic you're going to be merging into. So we accelerate, and my wife and I both have had this habit for a long time. Accelerate, merge into traffic, and then almost sub subconsciously glance down this at the speedometer to see how fast we're going. Now, we didn't actually say this, but my wife and I have both had this uh, happen to us on several occasions with this car. We merge into traffic on the interstate, glance down at the uh, speedometer, don't actually say, but could well imagine thinking, Shazam! I'm doing 85 miles per hour. It did it quickly, it did it quietly, without any effort. It just was magically at 85 miles per hour. And a couple times I turned off the cruise control and I found myself doing 100 or a little over 100. No sound, no clues that we were going that fast other than the speedometer. So it's beneficial to use the cruise control anyway because it's less tiring and uh, you get better gas mileage that way. Also, you don't find yourself inadvertently going 100 miles an hour when the speed limit is not. What this uh, video has to do with are some experiences that we had at Walt Disney World. Now, normally, because of my health issues, I insist on doing the Magic Kingdom on the first day because I don't always feel like doing something the second day. So I will spend the second day in the resort uh, recuperating and then later on in the afternoon hitting the uh, arcade that's at the resort. Most of the resorts have an arcade on property resorts. Most of the arcades have at least one pinball machine. I play every pinball machine I come across. This time though we did not hit the Magic Kingdom the first day because my youngest daughter is currently on a Japan kick. She got that way from Case Closed, aka Detective Conan. Uh, she watched a couple of episodes with me and got hooked on it and then I made the mistake of showing her my manga collection of Case Closed and um, she promptly adopted those and have been carrying them around with her everywhere and so they're quite dog-eared and so forth so I'm replacing them all so that my copies will be pristine even though many people have made this comment they, you, you can't tell by looking at one of my books that I've read it because even with paperbacks I'm very careful I don't want to crack the spine roll the spine. I see people with paperbacks in there, and, and, and I, I've seen them purposely break the spine <coughs> so that they can fold the book back and hold it in one hand. That's not me. I guess I'm anal or something, but I want my books to look brand new uh, forever. Anyway, because she's on a Japan kick and she's been teaching herself Japanese and she's actually becoming quite proficient at it, uh, she wanted to have uh, a meal at the Japanese restaurant in Epcot, which, by the way, is an expensive restaurant. So I decided, well, the first day we'll hit Epcot. We were too late for breakfast, so for well, we'll go to Epcot, go to the uh, Japanese Pavilion, and have lunch. And then she had originally only wanted to do one or two attractions, and then she wanted to go to the Magic Kingdom. But wound up, she didn't want to leave that thought. Um, eventually, I got worn out, and we had to leave. But we did manage to get quite a few. Uh, attractions in, but not as many as we could have. Anyway, I'm babbling and rambling, aren't I? 
We had lunch at the Japanese Pavilion restaurant. I don't remember what it's called. She, my daughter does, but I don't. The four of us for lunch with tip cost nearly $150. Now, food is really, really good. They set you with another family. So, something I noticed, they didn't, none of the other family members, uh, none of the family members from the other family ate all their food. All four of us ate everything. Cleaned our plates completely. And uh, my wife has made the comment that people who have gone with her, co-workers, and when I can't go, or people that she's sitting with there when it's she goes and I'm at home and there's another family there, can't get over the fact that they're constantly bringing you refills. New glass, new straw. And they don't even ask if you need it or want it. They just bring it. Shut it down. And what I found a little uncomfortable was all the bowing. I have never been bowed to so much in my life and having all these women bow to me made me feel uncomfortable. I know it's a cultural thing but still. One of the neat things about the Japanese pavilion apart from the really good restaurant that's there is the shop that is there. All the, all the pavilions at Epcot have a shop. Well, the Japanese one is cool. And it's always full. Even when it's not raining. When it's raining at uh, Disney World, the shops all fill up because people go into them to browse around while it's raining. But being Florida, it does it generally doesn't rain long and it stops and then everybody goes back out. But the Japanese shop is always full. That's what my wife said. And the reason is it is just so amazingly cool. All of the things they have. I picked up a lot of things in there. And I told uh, one I don't know if you've ever been to Epcot, but at all the pavilions, the employees there are all from the countries that they represent. The Chinese pavilion, everyone is from China. The Japanese pavilion, everyone is from Japan, and so forth. So, let's go through this shop and seeing all this amazing stuff I wanted, and I pointed out to uh, one of the women working there. She had a rather thick accent, but uh, I made out most of what she said. But I told her, I could really go crazy in here. I could spend a lot of money. And she said something along the lines of, so you think our prices are too high? Or, you know, uh, no, I mean, I want to buy everything in here, and I don't have that kind of money. Oh, so you like our store? Yes, I like it. I love it. I was going to save it to the end, but I did pick up a few things while I was in there. I also picked up a lot of Disney collector pins, which I'm saving for another video, because uh, every time my wife goes on a day trip, or I go, I pick up collector pins, and there's a couple of dozen that I haven't shown yet. And when my wife goes, whenever you go to a place that sells pens, these collector pens, and there are well over 17,000 that have been released so far, I, I finally asked one year, one trip, how often do you get in pens? And she said, well, some weeks it's not much. We only get in three or four just three or four pins, but packages of 
or boxes and boxes of three or four different designs of pens. But she says some weeks we get in dozens, dozens. And they have pens for everything. And there are pens that are quite rare because there are pens that are employee exclusives. There are pens that are sponsor exclusives. You know how all the pavilions are sponsored by Kodak, like Mickey's Fort Hill Magic is sponsored by Kodak, and Test Track is sponsored by Chevrolet, and so forth. The sponsors get exclusive pens that only they get. Employee of the month and that sort of thing, they have pens for that. Uh, they have pens for every park. They have pens for every attraction. They have pens for every character. They have pens that are exclusive to the Disney Cruise Line. They have pens that are exclusive outside of the U.S. like uh, Disneyland Paris and Tokyo Disney and Hong Kong Disneyland or whatever they call it. All the different uh, complexes, if for want of a better term, I can't say theme park because although all of the others are just one theme park, Walt Disney World you have the Magic Kingdom, you have Epcot, you have Animal Kingdom, you have uh, Hollywood Studios, which used to be called uh, Disney MGM, and two water parks. And they're talking about building another theme park there. And they have 13 or 14 on property resorts. So they're constantly building. And they still have a ton of land they haven't used. And they're currently expanding some of the existing parks. Like the Magic Kingdom has been going over extensive expansion. So, I mean, they're building a new roller coaster there, which I took a picture of. It's half finished. So I don't know what it's going to look like. But they're building it. They just recently upgraded one of the roller coasters in Fantasyland, I think it is. Uh, it had been called Goofy's Barnstormers, but it's called something else now. And they, of course, got uh, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, and they have Space Mountain, and then they have roller coasters at the other parks, like Rockin' Roller Coaster, which is the fastest roller coaster they have. Anyway, they're currently doing a lot of expansion at Epcot, I mean, Magic Kingdom. Now, I mentioned that I picked up some items at uh, the shop at the Japanese Pavilion in Epcot. This is one of the things I got. It's a hardcover book originally published in Japan, obviously in Japanese. This has been translated into English, and it has a forward by, forward by John Lasseter, director of Toy Story. He is also the current head of Disney and Pixar. He's a big fan of this anime director. And that's what this book is. It was written by this anime director. And it covers the years 79 through 96. All of these originally, I think, appeared in um, various publications in Japan, but they've been arranged in the book in chronological order, which makes sense. Published in the U.S. by Viz Media. So you should be able to pick this up at um, Barnes and Noble or Books a Million or order it that way. I've been reading it and finding it very good, but I didn't notice that there are photos.
Okay, that's as far as I'm going to open it. Really, really cool. And the woman who uh, uh, checked us out, big fan of this anime director. She starts rattling off anime series and movies that I'm not even aware of, but my eldest daughter was. She said she had seen them. Cool book. Now, they have a lot of manga and all kinds of cool things. Puzzles, jigsaw puzzles, where you make an image derived from an anime series or film. That's pretty cool too. But they also had some plastic model kits, which I collect. Now this was most recently, this, this particular car that this is a model of, marketed under about 10 different brand names by various companies at different times, although they were always made at the same facilities but manufactured in a lot of countries and on the market for a lot of years known by various names and there are some weird variations to this particular car but I recently bought the season one and season two box sets for chips and this is the car that officer John Baker drives when he is off duty. It's his car. I did not know that they had imported those into the US, but they did up until the point where they no longer met emission standards and bumper height standards and so forth. And so they couldn't import them into the US anymore. But it was kind of cool seeing this car because I had seen this car in so many British films and television shows. It's an iconic car. I'd help to hold it right side up. The Morris Mini Cooper. So there were several models of. This is the 1275S Mark I. And that looks very much like the one uh, that uh, Officer John Baker drove off duty. Eighteen dollars is a reasonable price. Okay, I think I've been all the way around now. But there were several others I wanted to get, but I wanted to get this one the most, so this is the one I wound up getting. I of course have made it quite clear that we will be hitting that store every time we go. Okay, what I want to talk about specifically in this video, and I'm 24 minutes in, and I haven't really even touched on it. Speed. I did mention roller coasters. Space Mountain seems faster than it actually is. But the reason it seems faster is because you're in the dark, and the turns are frequent, and they are extreme, and you have these sudden dips and you go up and you go left and you go right and uh, it's just one thing after another and you're in the dark so you don't know anything's coming and years ago when I could ride Space Mountain my glasses flew right off my head 
and I thought I had lost them forever, but got to the end of the ride and found them inside my rocket ship. So I was good to go. One I can still ride, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Now, they apparently have upped the speed on that one because something happened this time that has never happened before. And it happened to my wife, too. It happened to both of us multiple times. We would hit a dip, and then we would go up, and we would become weightless, and we would float up to where we were right up against the safety bar. And it felt like I was in midair for about four or five seconds before I came back down. That happened four times. It was really freaky. Man, they have sped this thing up or something. Test track. Used to be different than it is now. When you went inside... Uh, went to various displays and so forth and then you got to the ride itself and in the beginning there were weather tests and so forth and it's like if you see videos of it it's like you're driving uh, through a series of heat lamps and then extreme cold and sudden jags and bumpy roads and everything they've changed all that First thing you see when you go in there, and it's really awesome, is a prototype of a convertible sports car. And everybody who saw it was just, man, I'd love to have that car. I took several pictures of it, which came out very nice, and I'm going to eventually add them to my Facebook page. I'm trying to decide whether I should replace uh, my banner on my Facebook page to this. Currently I have a picture of a row of pinball machines that I took at Disney World one year. This long row of pinball machines. But I'm seriously considering using um, the photo, uh, that one of the photos I took of this prototype. A really cool looking car. Now you pick up a card and they have all these kiosks set up. And you, you can either use your card, one of the cards that you can get at the front, or you can use your room key card. And you wave it in front of the reader. And it says that it's ready. And you select the type of car you want, the design, whether you want a car for its performance, for economy, for handling or for speed. My daughter, eldest daughter, who went with me, we went in the single rider line, so we wound up being in two separate cars. But she chose a car based on performance. I chose a car based on top speed. Now, don't quite know how this would work. You get up First of all, when you get up to the end of the line, just before you get in your car, so you're waiting for your car to come, you swipe your card against another kiosk scanner that's there. There's six of them, three on each side. And it calls up your design, so you know you have the right one. And then you get in the car. Well, each car holds six people. So, potentially, there could be six different designs in there. How does it do that? How does it take six different designs and make the car perform amongst the parameters of the six different designs? I'm not quite sure how that works or even if it works, but it does track your performance. You get to certain points and it'll flash it'll put up a picture of all of the cars and the position and the seat for that car the rider and it gives you the performance data for that particular uh, test 
And these tests are not like the old tests. These tests are more like roller coasters. You suddenly get a burst of speed and then you suddenly break or uh, you have uh, a sudden uh, there's a semi that suddenly pulls out in front of you and it's all up neon. It looks really cool in the dark. And the, the you slam on your brakes and you kind of uh, swivel around the truck which is really cool. But the final acceleration which you have at the end this makes it the fastest ride at Disney World between all of the theme parks, even Rock and Roller Coaster, which is the fastest roller coaster there. Test track is faster. They not too long ago, when they renovated it, upped the speed on the final thing, where you're racing around the track. I know for well, they say this, and they've had it in their brochures, and they've had it in their TV specials, and so forth. But I also have proof. Because when I've written it in the past, this is a, just when you hit the fastest point, it uh, captures your speed. And it displays it at the top above your car as you're getting close to it. It used to be that I would hit a top speed of 59.9 miles per hour. This time around, I had a hit a top speed of 64.9 miles per hour. So they increased it by 5 miles per hour. But remember, you're in an open car, you're low to the ground, and the test track is narrow. So it's like the Star Wars trench effect. You feel like you're going a lot faster than that. But that's pretty fast considering you're on a rock, a open ride like that. 64.9 miles per hour. And you feel like you're going that fast too. In fact, you feel like you're going faster than that. So it's really cool. I remember the little girl that was sitting next to me, she said something along the lines of, this isn't as fast as I thought it would be. And then it's something like this. And we catapulted uh, faster and she said something along the lines of okay okay I take it back this is fast now I have some photos here I'm going to show you at Disney World you can get photo passes they're free they have photographers all over the place. Just hand them your card. Or if you don't have a card, they'll give you one. And they'll take your picture. And then it's uh, added to your card. There's a code on the back I'm not going to show you. Those pictures are then added to your online uh, file, I guess you would call it. Although each of the individual photos would be filed, so I guess that would be incorrect. But all of your photos wind up there. And even if you pay for a print, which I did pay for prints, you can access your pictures online. You can download them. You can print, you can print them. You can uh, send them as attachments with emails. Really cool. PhotoPass. Okay, I took a picture of my daughter on the ride and of me on the ride because we wound up in separate cars. We were in the single rider line. I believe I mentioned that. And so it's a matter of, you know, the, other, the main line, say how many in your party? Four. And they load a car with four people and they, then they take two people from the single rider line and whatever. Or five people get in from, with a party from the other line. It's only one person that can get, and that's what happened with us, each of us. We were just uh, one person pulled from the single rider line. The single rider line generally moves faster. You want to know one of the ways you can get banned from Disney World permanently? 
get in the single rider line, as a group of teenagers did. My wife told me this story. She either witnessed it or her co-worker witnessed it when she went on it. But these teenagers went on test track and they were in the single rider line so they can get up much faster. Then when they got there, they immediately went into a car as if they were in the regular line. And the employee there told, they, told them they had to get out and get in, back in the single rider line. And they argued with her. And they were giving her grief. That will get you banned for life at Disney World. Maybe even all of their theme parks. I don't know. But all of the theme parks at Walt Disney World, you pull a stunt like that anywhere, and you're going to be banned for life. Which is one of the reasons why everything is so uh, runs so well there. They have everything figured out, and if you have uh, people who think uh, the rules don't apply to them, try to break the rules, you're out of here and you're banned for the rest of your life. Bye-bye. Anyway, I wanted to show these two photos because it's, it's like a contrast. I want you to see the re uh, reaction uh, of my daughter when she was on it and then the reaction when I was on it. I asked her how fast her car went. She couldn't tell me. As I said, my 64.9 miles per hour. And they generally have the pictures taken on these kind of rides where you're going the fastest. I don't know how they get it to come out as clear as they do considering how fast you're moving at times because they must be using one fast shutter speed or something. I don't know what they're using. But the girl in the front wearing the white t-shirt is my eldest daughter. Notice the hair flying everywhere. Now she is fearless. She will go on any roller coaster no matter how extreme. Tire of Terror she's been on. She, on a rock and roller coaster and all that stuff. She's also fearless at water parks. She will get on the tallest water slide there is and just plop down and fly down as fast as she can. Okay. Now, theoretically, she could have put this photo on the same photo card, a photo pass card that I showed you earlier. But she gave me a separate card with a separate code on the back. Let's see here. Her expression? And then there's me, and I'm sure you'll recognize me. And I'm sitting in the same position she was sitting in, in, in the car. I just have my arms folded. Okay. Going 65 miles an hour. Having a good old time. Some would, some would say having my arms crossed like that is like a security thing. But it's more like it's um, uh, oh well. You know, I'm on this ride. But it is a cool ride. I highly recommend Test Track. 
uh, especially if you haven't been on it, or if you haven't been on it since they renovated it. So it's really, really cool. Now I'm going to have to do, I have a ton of homebrews that have come in for the Atari 2600, the Atari 7800, and the NES. I've also got a ton of video game ads that I haven't shown, but, and DVDs, and Laserdiscs, and LPs, and Disney collector pins. I guess at some point I could show my model kit collection. Yeah, I'm going to have to show all that stuff. I and mean, I've got a series that I'm, uh, I started to do a video of yesterday, but my web camera was not uh, cooperating with me. It was very jerky. I need to replace the video card that's in this computer. But um, I'm going to be doing a series of videos of my uh, decades in television broadcasting. As I tried to mention in the video I tried to do. I mainly worked behind the scenes but I met a lot of celebrities and I appeared on television a number of times and all of those appearances survive. Just uh, let you ponder that in your head as they can be uploaded to YouTube including one with me dressed like a turkey at the Jacksonville Zoo, surrounded by turkeys. That one never fails to crack people up. Uh, whenever uh, in the past I've shown it, it's like when I worked at that station, they gathered up like 30 or 40 people in, in the conference room and to screen it uh, with me there. And everyone cracked up at the end. At the end, I did some ad living, some improv. And that one little bit of improv right at the end cracked everybody up. And the director liked it so much, he kept it in. And the head of the promotions department liked it so much, he kept it in. So that was in the final promo that went out. Anyway, I'll get more into that story and others when I start that series. Until next time, stay awesome.